you all pretty much know this car. If you don't, you're going to find out all about it. And I am incredibly proud and pleased to welcome these guests to Vauxhall. Can I please ask you to give a very warm welcome to Richard Austin, Brian Osborne, and Ryan. I forgot your last name. What is it, Brian? Ellen, come on over. Come on over. Come sit down for me. Come on. So, Richard, come sit down, then we're going to have Brian, and then you, sir, on the end. So, we're going to sit down. I've never sat down at one of my shows before. I'm terribly sorry for you guys over there for not having a good view. I'm really sorry. But we've got cameras here, so you'll be able to watch it, and you'll be able to hear everything as well. If you do want to move around, there's plenty of spaces over here as well, so feel free to come around and move and join us. So... Hello again, Richard. Hello. Good to see you again. Uh, I am going to hand the mic over to you so we can all hear you. We've also got Brian Osborne with us. Now, you were the Chief Detective Inspector back in the early 90s and were responsible for trying to track 40RA down. And Ryan, oh, hang on, there we go. And Ryan here, you were. Uh, you did a lot of chasing of this recently when you did the story of this car uh, at the start of the year. A fantastic story, fantastic article. Uh, so we're going to speak to all three of you. You've all got very different takes on this story. You obviously own the car, had the car taken from you. You chased the car. And then 30 years later, you were chasing the car, just albeit in a very different way. Uh, so Richard... Let's start with you, the Lotus Carlton. Let's go back to even before that fateful night and let's talk about what life was like for you. Let's scene set. It's the early 90s. What was going on in your life? What were you doing then? Well, I was a new father. I was looking after my family. I'd got a business in Evesham selling computers and uh, it was going well. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get rid of that horrible pink Porsche that I was driving and replace it with a lovely coat, Lotus Carlton. And uh, there I lies the rest of the story. <laughs> so you, you got this, the pink Porsche, as, as you described it to me. And uh, you said to me when we met earlier this year that you weren't that keen on it, didn't really like it. And you're talking to one of your, one of your guys. You ran a, was it a computer business that you ran, yeah? Um, as he mentioned, oh, you looked at a Lotus Carlton. And that's where you started looking into the, looking into the car. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, this guy that told me, why don't you have a look at a Lotus Carlton? I mean, he's the most the sort of person you think wouldn't have a clue about cars and wouldn't have a clue about a Lotus Carlton. I had seen one uh, at the Lotus dealer only just manoeuvring round at the, Lot at the Vauxhall dealer in Worcester um, but then I looked into it and uh, basically it was right up my street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went gallivanting along it. <laughs> so um Unfortunately, that other mic died, so I have to do the whole one, two, one, two. Um, so when you saw it and first drove it, what, what was that like? I mean, I can't imagine what the... I've been out in your car. Um, you know, Mike Mitchell took me out in yours. But I can't imagine what this would have been like in the early 90s. What was it like when you first drove it? Like it is now. Phenomenal. <laughs> really quick and the... The overtaking acceleration um, just is, was mind-blowing then, and it is still, there's not much that will touch it. Yeah. It's, uh, somebody told me earlier, that, you know, it's, it was the fastest car in the world from 30 to 50 or yeah. something like that. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it were, I mean, I've got an ex-policeman <laughs> next to me, but, <laughs> but he's, not, he's not on duty, so... <laughs> I mean, I've done some, you know, I remember one particular time, you know, coming up behind, because it was a very threatening looking car and people generally moved over, but occasionally you've got people being awkward. And uh, this one time, I, over, I was indicated, started overtaking him. Of course, he closed up on the car in front. I just kept the throttle down, went past about five cars. <laughs> it was that quick. Um, and I won't tell you how fast it went on the M45 that, um, in that era, but it was uh, well in excess of double the speed limit. Wow, <laughs> wow. But, wow. Uh, yeah. 
it's good. And this one, they had the turbos redone, um, new injectors, um, and John, who's over there somewhere, um, has did all the work on it, and it's it's as good as a brand new one. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So, obviously, brings back many memories for you. Many, hopefully, many good memories. I remember when uh, we, when we met earlier this year, and we were talking about the car and reminiscing about it. You said that uh, was it your one of your children opened a passenger door onto a cyclist <laughs> and had to pay to have the, the bicycle repair and the door repaired. So it was your it was your family car, albeit an almighty quick family car. So let's go to that night. Let's walk through what happened. Over to you. Well, I was, I was fast asleep in bed and I uh, heard the car alarm going, looked out, because the car was below my bedroom window, looked out and there it was being tampered with by some guys. And anyone in their right mind who uh, thought about it probably wouldn't have done what I did. But I went tearing downstairs. Well, actually, first thing I did was I uh, opened the window and shouted, uh, shouted to them and told them to fuck off, you bastards. <laughs> and, uh, but they didn't. So I went tearing downstairs. And I, got, I was stark bollock. So uh, I, there was uh, one of my wife's jackets on the banister. I just put it over my, sh over my shoulders, popped outside thinking, I've rumbled them, they'll go. And this guy just stepped up to me and he knocked me flat. Boom. So the next thing I remember, I'm lying <laughs> spread eagled on my drive. Um, and I can hear, as I'm coming round, I could hear crunching and cracking of fiberglass. And they were using a Sierra Cosworth as a pusher. So you've got fiberglass against fiberglass and they're, you know, it's, not a pretty sound, and uh, they were pushing it off up the road. And uh, the next thing I did, run back in the house, call to my wife, say, call the police, I'm going after them. Now, I know this is crazy, but at this stage, I've probably only been awake three minutes, four minutes tops. So you're not really in the most sensible state of thinking. So uh, I jumped in her Renault Espace, and go off after them, and they're, you know, they're using this uh, Sierra Cosworth, pushing the car up the road, and then they turn left um, up a quieter road, and uh, it was pretty uphill, a bit uphill, and yeah, I'm following them up there. They, when they got to the top of the hill, they uh, were obviously fiddling with the electrics to try and get it going, and uh, there's me, sat in a Renault Espace, with no clothes on, um, and there's at least, I'd already seen three of them, there might have been more, uh, wondering what the hell am I going to do? Anyway, the next few moments, a Cavalier four-wheel drive turbo came reversing down the hill as fast as it could possibly go and smashed into the front, I tried to get away, reversed a bit, but smashed into the front of the Renault Espace and, you know, severely damaged it, steam pouring out everywhere, and uh, that was my hopes of doing anything, uh, severely defeated. And the next thing I know, they got the car going, and uh, I could hear it driving off into the distance, and uh, I limped back home in the very bruised Renault Espace, and that was the sum of that particular night. It was sort of ironic there was a car alarm going off as you were telling that. <laughs> but so that one night has now got all of these people sat here listening and so many more other people on the internet selling all these stories about it and so forth. Now we're gonna move from you, Richard, and we're gonna move on to on to you, Brian. So you chased 40 RA. I say chased. You, you were responsible for trying to track down this gang. Now, for those for young members of the audience who, who don't fully appreciate the, the Lotus Carlton, when, when it was announced, they actually tried to get it banned. You know, they, they, they 
debated it in the in the House of Commons and they said, you know, it's, it's so fast, this car, it, it's quicker than most of the Ferraris that are available today, that if someone steals it, we'll never catch it. You know, there, we saw we had a, a senator in here earlier off uh, auto barnstormers. They were trying to keep up with this, you know, and it was a, a more powerful, more powerful engine. You know, it was just a different league in terms of performance. And where this was stolen, they were effectively going over three counties. And back in the day, the police didn't always talk to one another that clearly, did they, between them? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, um, just to put the record straight, uh, I was a detective sergeant, uh, temporarily in charge of um, operations in Bromsgrove, in the CID there. Um, so this took place uh, in Evesham, uh, which was only a stone's throw away, the, the incident regarding Richard and 40 RA, but I knew nothing about that, and such was the communication between even neighbouring police stations in the day. Um, however, we very quickly became aware of 40RA, uh, the source of 40RA, and obviously the incident involving Richard by way of a series of um, armed robberies. And I, I say armed robberies in the sense that these criminals, we have some video of these criminals uh, in the day, and they were armed with um, batons and all that kind of thing. Nothing more than that, but sinister enough. And we had, I think, 10 or 11 offences. Now, the difficulty for us then was the fact that the offences took place over three police forces. There's West Mercia, where I was based, Warwickshire, and West Midlands. Uh, I was based in Rubery at the time, and we had several offences. And Rubery bordered um, West Midlands, as it bordered uh, Warwickshire. And that inherently caused a problem because, as you rightly say, Tim, communication between police forces in those days uh, was, to say the least, not very good. In fact, police forces sometimes withheld information from each other, all about kudos in the day. So these offences um, uh, started to take place, um, and the, the media hype was incredible in the day based on the fact that um, myth, folklore, started to gather momentum in that, you know, the strap line almost was, it's the car that the police force, car, or police vehicles can't catch. Well, I suppose that's correct, but in truth, there were very little or no actually actual pursuits for this car. It was seen, sighted, <coughs> uh, seen, sighted, that's the same thing, but it was seen after the event but it very, very quickly got away. And that's what actually happened. And in that locality, there were several miles of motorway very nearby. Um, the one thing that we did have, which was a bonus, was the communicate or the um, cooperation of the three forces with the Central Motorway Patrol Group in the day. So they were all alerted. And for the period of time that these offenses were taking place, and I can't remember over what period that was, we would every night be prepared for 40 RA. Um, and we never got anywhere near it on the basis that the offences took place and the car disappeared. Um, today, it wouldn't happen because the, the, the vehicle would be very quickly seen on the technology that's available. The real galling part of this vehicle is that the vehicle had the original number plates retained. So 40RA was emblazoned across its car as it was used for these offences. We were used to vehicles like Ford <coughs> Cosworths being on false plates, but this vehicle was taunting us, in fact. It was taunting the police knowing, or the criminals in it knew, that they would get away with the spoils of their crime. So that's the, uh, the very broad story. But the media hype was incredible. And with that came, uh, probably, uh, that came of great interest to the public. We were glad about that because the only way we were going to find this was a member of the public seeing it somewhere. 
Uh, but I imagine the criminals that were using this for the offences probably enjoyed that as well. So it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a melting pot of, of um, kind of interest, and and uh, the intention was at the end of the day was to try and rid the roads really of this car in the hands of the criminals. And uh, every morning during this period, by the way, I'd come to work, and my first question of the chaps in the CID were, "Has 40 RA been out tonight?" No. Oh, thank goodness for that. So the intention was to try and, we would never catch it, was to get, get it back from these criminals. And we did, in the end, by virtue of uh, using the police helicopter. Um, putting the helicopter up at various times, spooked the criminals, we think. And then that increased the hype from the media. Even the police helicopter can't catch 40 RA. <coughs> so, so it went on. So uh, I think I've been talking enough, haven't that's, I? That's right. I'm almost excited. This thing, is the one th this car, is the one thing in my service that's come back to bite me, honestly. Uh, I'm just fascinating hearing it, you know, firsthand. Um, of course, back in, back in the day, they, they used, um, it was ram raids, you know, it was you know, crashing into news agents to get cigarettes, alcohol, Money. That 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 was what they were. That's what they were really looking for. That that was the uh, that was the way to make that was the way to make money. Yeah. What I forgot to say, <laughs> as he snatches the microphone back, um, <coughs> these offences were serious offences in the day. Um, armed robberies. Um, goodness knows. Um, to this day, how many were involved? Um, where they are today? Because the <laughs> the, the people that are not sat here are the criminals that actually stole the thing and committed all those offences. Because when this was abandoned, we expected it to be um, carried on with another stolen, powerful car. But it never was. It was almost, they'd had their moment with 40 RA and um, ditched it in the canal. And the offences stopped at the same time. The good news for us was, but not for Richard, was the fact that the car was now off their hands because potentially had there have been a pursuit of any sort with the police it could have ended a, a lot worse the most serious offense of all of this was richard being assaulted actually there were no there was no violence nobody hurt in respect of the offenses committed by this but um ooh, yeah no fascinated to yeah, to think back then, you know, that, that was sort of the currency of criminality. That's that's what was valuable. In fact, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you something. You guys don't know that I'm going to do this, but I went on Google Maps and I found the news agents. You went back there for the photo shoot in Rubri, and opposite the news agents is the police station. Okay, so over here, I'm going to use you, madam. Hope you don't mind. You are the front door to the police station, okay? okay? This is how far away the front door to the news agents was. It's about there. That's how far away it was. And they ram raided it. And the only thing that happened, if memory serves me right, was they put a baton through the back window. That's as close as they got to it. Now, 40 RA was left in the canal, ditched in the canal over in Knoll, I think it was. You, at this point, Richard, had already sort of detached yourself from that Lotus Carlton and were actually, it's kind of ironic this, because our show is sponsored by an insurance company, but you were having a bit of an argument with your insurance company to get it replaced. See, there you go, Cherished Vehicle Insurance, free plug for you, the importance of having the correct insurance especially for something special like this? Because you were looking to replace it, pretty much. Yeah, it was a long, laborious negotiation with the insurance company. They offered me a derisory amount initially, and they kept increasing it, and I kept saying, well, look, I can't buy a replacement car for that sort of money. And in the end, they uh, surrendered and said, well, if you find one, equivalent sort of... Uh, specification, mileage, etc. we'll buy it for you. 
So we found an, another one that was down in Devon at the time and uh, eventually got the money out of them, bought that car and uh, I kept that one for like, 18 months, two years, I can't remember exactly and uh, sold it to a friend of mine who did the same sort of thing. So um, that was my second Lotus Carlton and this one here is my third. So uh, I think that's enough for one man. <laughs> Um, and before we come on to you, I've not forgotten now, I'm going to come on to you, but my last question for you, Richard, and hopefully our man over there with the sound system will turn it down a little bit for us, because we are trying to have an interview. If anyone wants to shout at him, feel free. Um, fast forward a few years later, and you've bought your third uh, Lotus Carlton, and we finally got 40 R. we finally got... One, two, we finally got 40 RA back on it. But not many people know that 40 RA was actually a sort of a birthday present for yourself, the number plate. It was, yeah. Uh, I think actually I'd, I'd already gone just past my 40th birthday when it came up for auction at a DVLA auction. So uh, um, fortunately I was able to, to get it and uh, use it on I've used it on a variety of cars it's uh, it's part of me however it's not mine it now belongs to my son who's also RA and I gave it to him on his 40th birthday but he's had to loan it me back for in perpetuity till I pop my clogs <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, he'll, he'll no doubt have the car as well but uh, so yeah um, that's how it how it happened and uh, there were some pictures, I had it on a, a bright lime green Hyundai Kona electric for a while and uh, the community took a very dim view of that. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, I've, been, I've really enjoyed getting back to a Lotus Carlton and uh, John who's done some work on it, he's over there somewhere. It's, uh, it's, it's remarkable, it's still, this one is as quick as the the first one I had, the second one I had, I never really liked it. It didn't go as well. Uh, a bit of transmission tunnel shake, and uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if you've ever done the same thing. You buy one type of car and replace it with another, and you know that's happened to me two or three times where you think this one's not as good, and that was definitely the case. But this one now, fantastic. Um, really uh, really goes nicely and cruises nicely it's not just about the speed you'd think it was a lot more modern car when you're traveling in it it's uh, smooth quiet easy good yeah. and i've been out in 40 ra and it is so smooth we went out in it after a few uh, few weeks ago and even now it still feels like a modern smooth car so i can only imagine what it felt like back in the 90s now you sir at the very end who've been waiting very patiently rather rather than me coming all the way what i'm gonna do is this there we go hi <laughs> so we have the man who bought the car originally we have the man who chased the car originally and now we have the man who chased the story 30 years later. Uh, so you, this was sort of one of your first stories for the magazine. Uh, yeah, it was. So um, I've been at Classic and Sports Car for a couple of years now. Uh, so yeah, I was looking for an opportunity to do my first big story. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously I knew about the car and the story, I'd seen it online, for like a lot of people. Um, I'd seen that Richard just bought another car. I was like, ah, perfect, yeah. good opportunity. Um, but I mean, it's mad really that the story is still so popular and it still yeah. crops up every so often i mean not to make you two feel old but it happened four years before i was born yeah um so you know as i say 30 years ago this year it all happened um but it's such a brilliant story and you're saying like the even with not just about this car but the lotus carlton in general uh how formidable it was when it first came out in the early 90s how quick it was uh I said it got debated in the House of Lords. Uh, the transcripts are online, actually, if you want to, have you seen it? But uh, you can find it all online where they um, were talking about it. But it's interesting because, like you said with Fry's at the time, you could still get cars that were quicker than this. There was the Diablo and the Ferrari, I think it would have been 348 at the time. 
Um, and it's not like this was especially cheap at the time. It wasn't like, mm. you know, one anyone could go and buy. But it did seem that people were, or, you know, police and uh, in government were generally quite frightened of it looking so ordinary, but actually being so quick. Um, I know when we're doing the story, I spoke to my manager who's been lucky enough to, uh, Alistair Clements, who's been uh, lucky enough to drive a lot, a lot, quite a lot of stuff. And it's a Vauxhall show, so I'm sure there's some VXR8 owners around. Yeah, but yeah. Um, he said this is still quicker off the line uh, than the VXR8. Um, I don't know if anyone's listening, you'll pull up at a red light somewhere out going out the show. And, um, don't do but, yeah. <laughs> Try please, and find out when, do while that. Brian's not looking. But um, yeah, it's just such a fascinating story. So yeah, we start looking into it. Uh, I mean, long story short, I mean, I say they've got, they were there and it's, yeah, such a fantastic story. But for, from what we did, I uh, found out Richard had the car again. I thought, oh, it'd be brilliant to, you know, do a photo shoot, get the whole story, try and get a police officer that works in it. So I, I, I found Brian through the National Association of Retired Police Officers, which is shortened to NARPA, which is much catchier than the full name. Um, but yeah, so I contacted him through that. Uh, we got, yeah, and he was happy to help out. Um, we found an old Rover SD1 police car, yeah. um, which was, would have been a little bit old for the time. I think you said it was BMW 3 Series and Vauxhall Senators it would have been at the time. Senators, yeah. yeah, they were the... Um, yeah, unfortunately, it was really hard to find a police car from that era. That's yeah. bit, I think the Met have a really good um, heritage fleet. West Mercia, Midland stuff is actually really hard to come by. So I think there's a Central Motorways Police Group Range Rover around somewhere that's part restored. There was a Rover 827 we found, which was about the right era, but that had literally just gone up to Scotland. And then we found out, so yeah, there's a West Mercia Police now have a Rover SD1. It's, it still belongs to them. Uh, I think the weird story of it is it covered a hundred... Uh, it was Dave Newbold... Uh, who's West Mercia's fleet manager, who brought the car along for us for the mm -hmm. photo shoot. Um, and he joined the police force, he joined the force about 11 years ago, I think it was. And this Rover SD1 was still technically on their fleet. Um, so obviously he joined, he was like, what is, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever it was, 20 something, 30, uh, 30 years, 40 year old car doing on the, uh, can't do my mental maths, uh, on the fleet still. And they had a system where when a car reached 120,000 miles, it was off the fleet, they retire it, mm. get something new. This car had 106,000 miles, it's basically just evaded being scrapped. They've been sat in the corner of their fleet somewhere, and then, long story short, it's been restored. Mm. It was restored just before our shoot. So, um, oh, well, yeah, really lucky we had that. It was yeah. literally, I think, they still needed to sort out the carbs a bit, so we had to go a bit slow on the motorway between our destinations. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're super lucky with it. And, um, yeah, we went back to, so we approached uh, BBC Midlands Today, who had some old... Uh, footage from it that they digitized which is where we saw the nice old videos of uh, Brian and Richard at the time um, looking very serious um, when they were trying to look for it and obviously they, that basically told the story so from there that's how I got in contact with Richard because it was in the in the description for the show um, and then yeah from there like you say there was the there was the the last place they did the ram raid on which was was Super Six in Rubri which I'm surprised they're not called Super Six anymore I think it's Gills News in Rubri High Street uh, if anybody knows, but um, yeah, it was the last one we did it to. So we, we met up in January uh, with the car. Yeah, we all met up. Um, must have been about 20, 30 miles away, I think, from where the, it was dumped in the canal. Um, and it just happened to be that it was pretty much, I think, one week out, but 30 years to the date it had been found, they'd found it in the canal. Um, so we went out to Ruby, took some pictures of it in front of the news agent and uh, roads around there. And then I think the final part of the story, which I managed, we, we, uh, the guy actually who pulled it out of the canal in Knoll, uh, this guy called Craig Tipping, who lives in Birmingham, um, found him through social, on social media. Um, and yeah, he just said, I think, got the call that some uh, canal boats have been scraping on, a, um, on something submerged in, in Knoll. And um, he went down in a, um, a Skidmore's garage, I think he worked for, he went down in an old Leyland truck and yanked it out of the river. And um, I think from there he took it to the forensic lab they covered it in some ultraviolet powder and, and yeah, I think off it went from there, it got scrapped. So, 30 years later, I think that was, yeah, how the story ended, as far as, unless anyone else can yeah. prove otherwise. But um, yeah, it's just a fantastic story, so. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, all that's left to say, and I'm hoping all of you'll help me uh, say thank you and appreciation for the guys coming down and spending some time with us today, uh, with a huge round of applause for Richard Austin, Brian Osborne and Ryan from Classic and Sports Car. Big thank you to all of them.
There you are, you've heard the story now. Whenever all of you now are ambassadors, okay? So whenever you see some rubbish being said about 40 RA on online, you can now say, Well, I heard the original story at Vauxhall, and then you can post a link to the video. All right, thank you very much. I need them views. And oh, yeah, he's, he's happy to take questions. Happy to take some questions. So then. Who has got a question? Yes, you over there. Right, I'm going to come over to you. Yeah, you. You you put your hand up. You have a question. Have you got a question? Yes. How much did you buy this Carlton for? Woo! <laughs> you did say any question. So, your Carlton, are you prepared to share how much it cost you? I bought this one quite cheap because it is... Uh, it, for one thing, it was in the Outer Hebrides on that Isle of Lewis. And mechanically, it wasn't very good, really. It had a lot done to it. So if you add together what I paid for it and what I've uh, had to spend on it, I guess it's about 60,000. Well, you, no, it's not bad. But I took the plunge with a car that I'd never seen. Um, I just uh, thought, right, I, we can make something of this. And so I was lucky. Yeah, I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> well, my son might benefit from it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you to share that information. Right, any more questions? Let's see hands. Yes. Oh, I might know you've got a question. Now, go on. What's your question, sir? Hey, Richard, who valets your car? Hey, there you go. Who, who valets your car? Who cleans your car? Um, some schmuck I met. <laughs> at school years ago. <laughs> you walked into that one, didn't you? Right, any more questions? For, yes, you, sir, you, sir, you, sir. Look at that. There we go. Has the story pushed the value of the plate up? That's a good question. Your number plate, do you think, or has the story and what happened increased the value of the number plate? I think the car and number plate are in, inextricably combined and, you know, should either one come up for sale, they'd have to be sold as a pair. Now, what that would fetch, I have no idea. It depends how badly somebody wants it. And if, ideally, if there's two people bidding against each other, it could be quite a bit, but I'm never going to find out. <laughs> good man, good man. Any final questions for, for Richard, for Brian, for Ryan? And yes, you, sir, go on. Don't be shy. I tell you what, I'm getting my steps in today, aren't I? Any of the Richard said, um, I grew up in Knoll, and we, my friend and I, went on our push bikes and watched it get pulled out. But I didn't know it was what it was at the time. Wow. So you actually saw it getting pulled out, and very kindly, Brian has shared some of the footage of it coming back into the um, into the lab, off the back of the um, off the back of the recovery vehicle. It's, it's quite sad to see actually it was quite sad to see such a special car treated that way um last question then yes sir i'll come over to you i'm really am getting my steps in today what, what was the number of the first r 40 ra your first car what build number was it? what was the build number can you remember Ooh, on the spot now Unfortunately, I don't remember and uh, I haven't got a clue. I wish I had and I wish I'd taken more pictures at the time, but sorry, can't help with that one. There you go. You've, you've asked the final question for us. The final myth of 40RA remains unanswered, even with the original owners and you know, everyone who was involved in it originally. We still don't know the original number. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please ask you just once again to put your hands together for our guests here today. A big thank you from all of us here. Thank you. Just a, just a very quick um, question. Uh, if any of you can help us with our inquiries <laughs> into tracing... <laughs> The criminals, please uh, form a queue by the um, vehicle the commentary point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Yeah, we did actually try and get uh, a police car to follow you here, but uh, we didn't quite manage that. So, ladies and I really hope you enjoyed that interview. Thank you so much for all standing by the uh, by the arena and listening. Really do appreciate it.